for joining us for the Holocaust Center for Humanities Lunch and Learn program. I'm Alana Cohn Kennedy, the Chief Operating Officer at the Holocaust Center. You are going to hear a remarkable story today, a story about a young Jewish woman from Hungary who experienced the upheaval of everything she knew. Forced into slave labor in Auschwitz and other camps, she would be one of the only survivors of her family. If you would like to have a live transcript during this program, you can do that by clicking the option live transcript at the bottom of your screen and then click show subtitles. The Holocaust Center for Humanity, located in downtown Seattle, sits on the traditional land of the Coast Salish peoples. The Coast Salish people is an umbrella term for numerous tribes that inhabited the Pacific Northwest. We honor with gratitude the land itself and those who came before us, stewarded the land, and remain leaders and activists within our communities. The Holocaust Center for Humanity is open every Sunday from 10 to 4, and whether or not you have been there, I invite you to come and visit, take in a story, leave a note in our memorial wall, and help us to remember, preserve, educate, and take action. We have a special temporary exhibit coming to the Holocaust Center, and you all are the first to know about it. It will be on display from October 23rd through December 13th. The exhibit is entitled BESA, A Code of Honor. This exhibit tells the story of Muslim Albanians who rescued Jews during the Holocaust. In 1933, Albania had a total population of 803,000 people, and among this population were only 200 Jewish people, although more than 1,000 Jewish people fled to Albania from neighboring countries to find refuge. The Germans occupied Albania in 1943. The Albanians defied the Nazis' orders to turn over lists of Jewish people and went as far as helping Jews to create new identities, hiding them, and protecting them. This exhibit tells the stories of those Muslim Albanians who went above and beyond to protect their Jewish neighbors. You can plan your visit to the Holocaust Center and come and see the exhibit starting on October 23rd. I know I've said it before, but this community of Lunch and Learn viewers is the best. Thank you to all of you for your curiosity and interest in learning. We are putting together an opportunity just for you. On November 8th, we will be holding our annual Voices for Humanity event. Voices for Humanity is a fundraiser that is powered by the people and that makes it possible for us to do this work throughout the year. This year, the event will be both in person and virtual. On November 8th, we are putting together a special table for our Lunch and Learn viewers. This is a chance for you to meet one another in person if you choose or virtually. And some of you have already registered for the table. Thank you very much. Did you know that at every Lunch and Learn program, there are hundreds of you that tune in to take part and even more who watch the program after it's aired. This is an incredible community of learners and I'm excited to get some of you together in the same room at the Sheraton in Seattle or in a virtual space on November 8th. There's a link in the chat where you can register. When you register, look for the field that says event host and you will see an option for lunch and learn guests. You can also add it in the notes section. With us today is Jack Shalom, the son of Holocaust survivors. While Jack's parents are no longer with us to tell us their stories, Jack carries on this legacy. He is a part of the Holocaust Center Speakers Bureau and is a member of the Holocaust Center's Board of Directors. We will take questions at the end of the program. Please enter questions anytime through the Q&A at the bottom of your screen. Thank you so much, Jack, for joining us today and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Alana, uh, and the Holocaust Center for inviting me and putting on this, these informative and important lunch and learn um, lectures that we hear. Um, I'm here today to tell you my mother's story. I'm going to tell you the story with my mother. I will tell you some, and then I'll have video clips of my mother telling her story. 
This is my mom uh, on the left when she was a young lady and on the right, as she would say, I was just a little bit older. For 20 years, she told her story. As she got older, I drove my mother to her speaking engagements all over the state and listened to her story. She always began by saying that she was here to talk to you so that you would hear directly from her what happened during the Holocaust. This is what she actually said. When I go to schools and talk to the students, I tell them, you're wondering why I'm still talking about the Holocaust. I feel it is my duty that I should, that I still should talk about the Holocaust. So you will know you heard from a survivor. My mother passed away in June of 2015. I wanna honor that sense of commitment she felt for all uh, her friends and family that she lost. I wanna honor that by taking up the duty by passing on her story. So let me get started. My mother was born in Gyur, Hungary, which is approximately 75 miles from Budapest. And today you can take a fast train there in uh, around an hour and 15 minutes, which I've done. This is my mother uh, and her family. My mother had an older sister and a younger brother who's not pictured here. Her mother died when she was very young my, when my mother was very young and my grandfather remarried and she was raised by her stepmother who she dearly loved. She was 22 years old when the Germans occupied Hungary in March 19th of 1944. Uh, Anti-Semitism in Hungary was already very prevalent. Here you see in the picture, my, uh, my grandmother Janka, uh, my mother, my aunt Yoli and my grandfather Gyula. And on the far right is my uh, mother's stepmother, Ethel. The Hungarian Arrow Cross uh, had already been responsible for many acts of violence and discrimination against the Jewish population. When the Nazis came into Hungary in 1944, Jews were quickly deprived of the rights. Hungary was always a very um, anti-Semitic country. And when the Germans came in, it's not only the German SS who did the, the dirty work, but also the Hungarian SS, and they called the Arrow Cross. It was forbidden for students at that in 1939, I finished high school, and my dream was to go to college and become a kindergarten teacher, but it was impossible. And my sister, who just graduated from college and became a teacher, she couldn't get a job because they fired people, Jewish people, not hiring. Soon after the Nazis came into Hungary, able-bodied men, like my grandfather, were forced into slave labor camps in the area. One night, a non-Jewish neighbor stopped my mother while she was on the way home from work and told her that their family was being forced to move. They had to leave their house with just a little suitcase. One night, a neighbor girl waited for me at the train station and said, don't be surprised because your parents and your brother is already back and you will have to use your, you, you have to leave your home. The next morning, we had to leave our home and we were still in our home when people come in and whatever they wanted to take up, nobody stopped them. So they took us for to a, um, small apartment building and a room, like a normal sized bedroom. We were 10 people slept in that bedroom. In the spring of 1944, all Jews were forced into a cramped quarters in one small area of the town. The area was called ghettos. The Jews were prisoners there and could not leave. 
life in the ghetto was very difficult and disorienting. The Gestapo, the German secret police, ran the ghettos. And they routinely, re, uh, re, the, almost always harassed and abused the people there. After living in the ghetto for several weeks, my mother had the opportunity to escape and hide in the village. However, she chose to stay with her mother who was already very, very weak. Finally, my mother, her brother, my grand, and my grandmother were loaded onto cattle cars and deported to Auschwitz, a destination that was unknown to them at the time. And if you ever read the book Night by Elie Wiesel, you know that the Jews did not really know about what was happening in other countries. Last time my mother saw her father was when she was on the train about to be deported. Finally, one day they said they are going to take us again somewhere. And they put us in a cattle wagon and each section about 100 people. And we were just packed in. But somehow um, I was pushed to a little window and as I looked out the window, I saw my father standing outside and he had a little package in his hand. And I yelled out, dad. And I, I pushed myself, I wanted to go to the door and my father wanted to come up on the train. And then I, the Hungarian SS asked him, what is he doing? And he said, my family is on this train and I have a little package to give them food. And still my father was hoping that he can be together with the family and tried to push himself up to the train. So unfortunately they dragged him they started to beat him, kicked him. They took away from here the pack, him the package saying that they are going to give it to your family. And they pushed him until he disappeared inside the building. And that was the last time I saw my father. Hungary was the last country to be occupied by the Nazis. The Hungarian Jews were deported to Auschwitz in the spring of 1944. The Allied forces landed on the beaches of Normandy on June 6, 1944. This was two weeks before my mother's transport arrived in Auschwitz. There's a picture of good and evil. The good, of course, are the Allies landing in Normandy, and the evil are the Hungarian Jewish prisoners un undergoing a selection in Auschwitz. After being separated from her father, my mother and her family spent several days in a dark, crowded, and filthy cattle car. Nobody knew where they were going, what would happen, or if they would ever see their loved ones again. My mother arrived in Auschwitz on June 21st, 1944. And here's another picture of the Hungarian Jews going uh, under, uh, undergoing a selection at Auschwitz and them getting off the, the cattle cars. Well, after traveling night and days, night and days, finally, on the 21st of June, I remember the date because that was the date of my brother's birthday, 15 years old. So we were so glad that finally, we arrive someplace and we can get out of the train and breathe some fresh air. So we got uh, down the lens. They had to stand right away, five, five in a row. And then they yelled out, separate the woman and separate the man. And at that point, they took my brother away. So upon arrival, she was separated from her, uh, from her mother and younger brother during the process called selection, which was conducted by the infamous evil Dr. Joseph Mengele, who sent arrivals to their death into the gas chamber or to become slave laborers. The pain of being separated from her brother 
and her mother was but the first of many hardships that my mother would endure during the time she spent as a prisoner in the Nazi regime. Dr. Mengele was responsible for sending thousands, hundreds of thousands of people, including my grandmother and my uncle, to the gas chambers where they were murdered and cremated. The smell of human bodies were being burned and the smoke from the crem crematorium haunted my mother every day of her life. There was Mengele standing and he was the one who will decide who will live or who will die. And of course, by that time, my mother was very, very weak already. So he sent my mother on his left and me on, on the right. And I ran after my mother again and, and they pulled me back and they said, they will, she will go to shower, I will go to a shower and we're gonna be together again. So I hugged my mother and I kissed her and I said, mom, I'll see you later. But of course I had never seen my mother again. The reason I was a strong girl back from back home and uh, healthy looking. So they thought that I'm okay to work. I remember uh, when I was around 10 years old, my mother told me this story. And uh, I remember she said that, uh, she said, I love you, mom, as she was being taken away. And her mother turned to her and said, thank you for everything you've done for us. I'll never forget that. Again, as we were standing in the line, we noticed that there's a chimney and from the chimney, a black suit and smoke came and the smoke smelled horrible, like burned flesh. So we asked the people who were working on the side, what is the smell? And they said, if tomorrow your mother, father, sister, brother, they will be taken to a crematorium and that's the smell you have. I never even heard the name crematorium before. And so also I have to say that at that point, they would grab from an old woman, no, I should say, I'm sorry, uh, from a young mother, who was holding a, a baby or a toddler, they grabbed away from them and they gave them to an old woman. And you can imagine how the mother was screaming, crying, why are you taking my child? And they said, this old lady will take care of the children. And after you guys will take a shower, you can have the babies back. But unfortunately, we found out later that the old lady and those children, they went to the gas chamber and they were cremated. This is the, uh, uh, the statistics from the uh, Hungarians during the Holocaust. As you can read here, 825,000 Jews were in Hungary in 1941. Hungary was not invaded by the Nazis until 1944. And all the living as Jews was difficult. Jews were relatively safe from deportation to death camps. Many Hungarians who survived were hidden in Budapest, in churches, convents, private homes, and hospitals. Some Jews in Budapest were hidden in safe houses by the Swedish diplomat, Raoul Wallenberg. 564,000 died from starvation, murder, or gassing, most of them at Auschwitz. And fewer than a third of those who were in Hungary in March of 1944 survived the Holocaust. This number includes camp survivors. In the course of almost five years, 1 million Jews and 200,000 others were deported and systematically murdered at Auschwitz, most of them the day they arrived.
second here. Okay. Um, this is a, um, this is a map of the, um, the journey that my, my mother took. Um, after 10 days in Auschwitz, my mother was transferred to Plaszow, which was a slave labor camp near Krakow, Poland. So she went from year Hungary to Auschwitz and then over to Plaszow. This is uh, some photos from Plaszow. Uh, the beatings and the abuse from the guards were very prevalent there. Uh, one time my, my mother was beaten by one of the guards. My mother told me that the group that she was with had to fill up wheelbarrows with dirt and take it up a hill, empty the wheelbarrow, fill it back up again, and take it back down the hill. Her foreman, her foreman had said that if he was not with them, he gave her group permission to rest halfway up the hill as long as no one was watching. Well, unfortunately, a, German, a guard with a German shepherd by his side saw them resting. He began to scream at the group of prisoners, and my mother who did not speak that much German at all, she didn't know that he was signaling her out. Finally, another foreman from another group walked over to the guard. I'll let my mother tell you the rest of the story. The very first thing when we faced him, he gave a small slap on the man's face. And then he looked at me and again, he started to say the same words. And again, I had to tell, I am sorry. And he started to beat me and kick me. I tried to protect my face. He kicked me his boot in my stomach and my, and then my, I, it was to the point that my eyes were so blurred already and my mouth started to bleed and I, I didn't know, I still, as I think back, I was hoping that he's give uh, a, uh, the dog the word to attack me. So one of the Hungarian girl who was working on the side couldn't take it anymore. And he walked up to him and said, officer, please, that girl does not understand German. Can I help her? And at that point, he said, ask her, why did she smile? And he said, look at that face, she's smiling again. And of course, you can believe that I didn't have a reason to smile. And I, I don't know what he saw on my face. And finally, he let me go. And this guy who got that little slap on the face said, I'm gonna make your life hell. And every single morning, he would take me out from other groups and took in his group. And I can't even tell you hard work what he gave me. But I, as long as I can do it, fine. If not, if I die, I die couldn't do anything about it. As the Russians moved closer to Krakow, the Germans moved the prisoners and Plaszow back to Auschwitz. My mother often spoke of that day because it was then that she received her tattoo. Students always ask my mother to show them her tattoo from Auschwitz. She shows it to them so they will know the reality of her story. And she's showing it in, in a video here to a middle school student. Before we do that, this is the uh, picture of the Nazi occupied territory in red. Sweden is right in the middle between Norway and Finland. That was the uh, neutral uh, country at the time. When 
in Krakow, the Russian army got closer to Krakow. So the German didn't want them to see a concentration camp. So they decided to take us away from over there. And we winded up again in Auschwitz. And I remember it was a very, very hot day and we had to stand in a line. And this is the time when we got our tattoos, the numbers. One seven one seven zero. Every second day we had selection and we had to undress entirely naked and run between SS officers and and if somebody couldn't run fast enough, they said, just go on the side and we're gonna send you to a doctor. And even if, if the person was skinny, but healthy, but they thought because they were skinny, they wouldn't be able to work. So, but of course, later on, we found out there's no such a thing as a doctor. They were sent again in the gas chambers and cremated. Auschwitz and Plaschow were not the only camps my mother was in. She was also in two slave labor camps in Germany, Augsburg and Mühldorf. The Germans needed people to work in a factory, so my mother and 500 other of uh, Hungarian women, some of them, the same girls from her hometown were sent to Augsburg, Germany to work in an armaments factory. So she went from Plaschow to Auschwitz, to Augsburg, over to Mühldorf. In the factory, they were making aircraft parts. My mother was assigned to work outside to clean rubble from another bombed factory because of all of the Allied bombing. My mother remembers going back and forth on trains. And finally, she was liberated by the American army in May 1st of 1945. She was moved to a displaced persons camp in Germany called Feldefink. It was a former Hitler youth compound. And at this displaced persons camp, that's where my mother met my father. He was one of a group of Greek Jews from Salonika, Thessaloniki, who survived Auschwitz. And my mom will, uh, my mom will tell you her story. I apologize, having technical difficulties. Sorry about that. Yeah. We were already liberated and we were in a DP camp. When I had my girlfriend, whose name was also Magda, and that point already she had a Greek boyfriend. And she was asking me if I would go with her to the barrack because she wanted to visit the boyfriend. And I said, okay. So of course she went to see the boyfriend and I was just sitting on the window sill and at the entrance of the barrack and waited for her to come back. A young man came in and suddenly just stopped. And he looked at me and he said in German, Fräulein, Name, which, what, what was my name? So I told my name and I pointed at him. I said, you? And he told me his name. And then he started to talk. I didn't understand a word. 
because he couldn't speak my language, Hungarian, and not even as much German as I could. But he spoke six other languages, but I, I didn't uh, understand uh, any of, of his language. And then suddenly said the word rendezvous. And rendezvous was in my country, and I think many other countries meant a date. And I said, okay. And this is how I met my husband. And about six weeks later, we got married, not even knowing the language. And uh, I lost my husband in 1955. After he was sick with a stroke for five and a half years. And if he would have lived another month, we could have celebrated our 50th wedding anniversary. And this is, I always tell the story for the children. I think my mother uh, had the, she emotions, her emotions got the best of her. Uh, my father passed away in 1995 um, after uh, a few years of, of having a, a stroke. Uh, my dad was uh, born in Thessaloniki, Salonika, Greece. And during World War II, uh, the Nazis occupied Greece uh, in uh, 1941. 1943, they forced Jews from Salonika into ghettos and began deporting them to labor in concentration camps. And approximately 50,000 Jews from Salonika were deported, uh, deported to Auschwitz. And those figures, as it says, vary. After the war, <clears throat> only 2,000 Jews were in Salonika. They would make the, uh, the men stand in a uh, a center of the uh, the city, there's a town square, and they took the men and they had to uh, stay in these uh, in a big square, as you see here, for days at a time. And it was hot, and uh, those that fainted uh, were taken away, and most of them were never seen again. And also, they were made to uh, do calisthenics uh, just to humiliate them and. Uh, a lot of these men, again, would faint and would be taken away. Salonika is a beautiful little city. Uh, it's uh, located in northern Greece. Um, and it's, uh, I, I visited there before, and it's, it's, it's a beautiful place. So here's the uh, aftermath and post-life uh, pictures of my mother and father. Uh, before they immigrated to Seattle in 1951, my mother and father had uh, two children, my older brother, Henry, and my sister, Lucia, pictured here on, on the left with my mom and dad. I was born in Seattle after my parents settled in the United States. Picture in the middle is a picture of my, my dad, <clears throat> my mom in the middle, and my uncle, uh, Jocko, who survived the, uh, the camps with my father, <clears throat> excuse me, and uh, unfortunately, he died in a um, <clears throat> in a uh, motorcycle accident in Germany while at the DP camp. And then the picture on my right, right on the right is uh, my mom and dad on their wedding day in uh, 1945. So this document shows uh, that my my parents, my brother's sister, my brother and sister's arrival in the United States. They landed in New Orleans. Uh, en route to San Francisco, and finally settled in Seattle. It also lists the name of the ship and their tattoo numbers. Here's a picture of a, a bowl that my mother, <clears throat> while she was in Philippine, a woman there gave her while, who was leaving for Australia. She gave her this bowl and had my mom use it for her soup. The woman had been in a slave labor camp at a BMW factory that was set up to make airplane, uh, airplane engines. And you can see the BMW insignia on the bowl. My mother brought it back to, with her to Seattle and it's now in the center's exhibit and helps us understand how the Nazis system used and included slave labor work camps. 
I earlier talked about Raoul Wallenberg. My Aunt Yoli was saved by, uh, by this hero, Raoul Wallenberg. Uh, my mom and my aunt did not see each other again for 24 years. They got reunited in 1968. Raoul Wallenberg was a Swedish diplomat, architect, humanitarian, and businessman. Uh, while serving as Sweden's special envoy in Budapest, between July and December of 1944, he issued protective passports and sheltered Jews in buildings designated as Swedish territory. Wallenberg saved my aunt's life by issuing her a Swedish passport and preventing her from being deported to Auschwitz. So here's the journey my mother took, the year Auschwitz, Plaschow, over to Augsburg, Mühldorf, and then the Feldefink. It's over 1,100 miles. And again, they didn't know where they were going and what was going to happen when they get there. Here's my parents' legacy. Uh, on the left is a picture of my, me and my, uh, my son, who's uh, going to be 27, living in Scottsdale right now. And uh, the right is my sister and uh, her son and daughter, and two of the two of my uh, mom's uh, great grand uh, children. There's another one that's not in this picture. And then here's a picture of my brother and his large family. Um, this taken a while ago. A picture on the right is uh, our family got together when my mother was honored by the Holocaust Center some years ago. She now, my mom and dad um, have six grandchildren and six great-grandchildren. She had a chance to uh, meet the, the uh, director, producer, Steven Spielberg. Here's a picture of her with uh, Fanny Wald, who was also a Holocaust survivor, a beautiful woman. Um, she met Steven Spielberg. She got a chance to talk to him one on one. Um, I was there when she met him. Uh, she thanked him very much for doing all he did. He's done for the Shoah Foundation and for making the movie Schindler, Schindler's List. And uh, they talked for a good 10, 15 minutes. And when they were done, both of them had tears in their eyes. And uh, he was just a very, very kind man, very, very nice man. So here's a picture of my mom. Uh, when I, as I said, my parents had you know, many family friends uh, who were Holocaust survivors. And we we're all like family to each other because you know basically we, we really had no other relatives. Uh, all of them have been murdered in the Holocaust. So my mother did tell her story when I was growing up, but when my father had a stroke and could not talk, she decided it was time for her to tell her story. She wanted everyone to be a witness because of those who denied the Holocaust. And I told you, I told you as I began, my mother, as my mother got older, I drove her to different speaking engagements. And she had many interviews for TV and radio. And I saw the tremendous impact she had on students and uh, other organizations, people that she talked to. You know, I'll never forget that there was a quote by uh, Viktor Frankl, who was uh, a Holocaust survivor himself. Uh, he was also a philosopher. Uh, he was asked after all he went through what he thought of the human race. And he said, there are only two races in this world, the decent and the indecent. I hope I've, had, I've been able to bring my, my mother's story to you as she told it. I thank you for listening to my mother and I thank you for listening to me. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jack, for sharing your mother's very powerful story. We have lots of questions. So I'm gonna pick a few to ask to you. Um, the first one comes from Debbie and she asks, what language did your parents speak with each other? Well, eventually they, they spoke Yiddish. They, know, they knew Yiddish. And, um, and being in Germany, 
they, my mother began to learn German uh, as well. So that's how they started to speak to each other. Uh, of course, when they came to the United States, they, uh, they immersed themselves into uh, uh, their life here and they learned um, English at Broadway High School, which is up, uh, Seattle Central Community College up on Broadway. And, uh, but they still spoke uh, German around the house to keep secrets uh, from my, my brother and sister and myself. Um, I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit about what life was like for your father in Salonika, Greece, before the Nazi occupation. What was Jewish life like for him growing up there? It was, it was a beautiful, uh, it was very vibrant. They, they, it was almost like a, a, a little Israel there because there were so many Jews in Salonika and uh, they were uh, businessmen there and uh, they had parts of, uh, in the government and they, it, was, uh, it was a beautiful in Salonika. It was, there was really no problems um, in that uh, part of Greece for them. So this next question comes from Marcy and she writes a very moving presentation. Thank you. Can you please say more about why it took so long for Magda and her sister to finally find each other? Well, my, um, <clears throat> my sister and her husband and uh, they have a son, uh, John, they stayed in Hungary and that was a communist country. So trying to communicate, uh, to uh, any, anything behind the cur Iron Curtain was very difficult, um, especially back in those days. It was, you just couldn't pick up a cell phone and, and call. And uh, so they found out where each other were, I believe through the Red Cross. And we finally got a phone call into her. Um, and I'll never forget, you know, you know, just like listening to someone up on the moon, but they finally connected with each other and um, they, they got to see each other in person uh, when my parents went up to Canada to visit uh, and they, they were able to fly to Canada and that's when they finally saw each other after 24 years. Wow, that must have been quite a moment. Yeah. What, so Jack, you described how your sister was saved by, or your sister, your mother's sister was saved by Raul Wallenberg. How did she get connected to Raoul Wallenberg and to that fortunate circumstance and the rest of your family didn't have that opportunity? Right, so my, my aunt was a teacher uh, uh, in, um, in uh, Hungary at the time. And at that time she was living in um, Budapest. And so that's where her connection came in. She wasn't back in the little, little village of uh, uh, Tatabanya, where my, where my mother is from. And so uh, that's how she got the connection for um, Raoul Wallenberg, because she really wasn't at home at the time. Mm. Okay, interesting. Um, so another question comes, and it's again about your father. Did he ever share his experiences the way your mother did? No, for... No, he really didn't. You know, he was he was in the camps much longer. Uh, the Greeks were in the camps much longer. They're they're very, you know, Greeks are very proud people, and uh, he just he he did not really say anything about what happened during uh, in the camps. Um, I know I I had the opportunity to go to Dachau uh, with my parents, um, and I know it was very emotional for him too because. Like he said, you can show the camps here and you can show the, the barracks, but you can't, you can't feel the, what was in your heart at the time because he didn't know where his parents were, where the, <clears throat> where the rest of his family was as well. But he kept it to himself. And um, I, I, know, I know that affected him, it affected him greatly uh, sure. throughout his life. And so you went with your you went with your parents to Dachau. Did your did your mother ever return to Hungary? Yes, we did actually. Uh, in fact, I joined them when they went to Hungary. Uh, stayed in Budapest, and then mm -hmm. we took that train to the village uh, in uh, Feldafink and uh, got to see where she was 
she was born and where she lived. And um, it was uh, really uh, interesting at the time. Uh, the wall was still up and, and um, here I am walking down the street with Levi's Converse and a, a sweatshirt saying USA across it. So it was, it was um, a very interesting time uh, going there. Uh, I will tell you that when we did take the train from Budapest to this small town where my mother was from, uh, they had a, uh, we, we shared it with um, the train with a, a group of uh, Soviet and Hungarian soldiers too. So, um, but my mom was determined on going back and, and showing me where she was, uh, she, she grew up. Hmm. Yeah. And what was that like for her to be back there? Uh, it was, you know, uh, she wanted to uh, show me inside of the one house where she where she lived, but the the person there wouldn't let us go in because they, you know, we looked almost for we looked like aliens to them actually, mm -hmm. and so um, she really did not want to go back to Hungary. Uh, she said that was enough. Uh, she was she, her country was the United States. Mm -hmm. Wow. So, so Jack, I wonder, you know, here you were growing up, you said your mom told you some of these stories when you were about 10. And I, I guess I wonder, like, once, once you were old enough to kind of understand this history of your family, how, what did you make of all of it as a kid growing up with this, with this family history? Right, I get that question a, a lot from, from the different students, and it, uh, it it's life changing. Uh, it does give you a sense of gratitude, not only for what you have, but but for just waking up in the morning and seeing a, uh, you know, being free, and uh, it, it it was life changing even when I was a little kid that I was became thankful for everything that we had. Um, and I could see it in my parents that, uh, you know, I could hear sometimes uh, my parents would wake up in the middle of the night or, or from a nightmare. And, um, and I know what, what was, what that was all about. And I talked to my mom about it later. And, you know, my, my father and my mother would still have nightmares about it. Hmm. You know, so I have one, I have one last question for you. I, but I want to preface it by saying, you know, I feel so honored that I had the good fortune to meet and get to know your mom a little bit over the years. And she was such a beautiful, warm hearted person and so sharp and funny. And I wonder, you know, if she was with us today, what what advice what would she want us all to know what what advice would she give to all the rest of us here she would she she would be asked that question by students too and she would say almost all the time be nice to everybody be nice to your fellow human being you don't have to be mean to people you don't have to be angry at people just be nice to people and the world would be a better place I had great words to live by um, Jack, thank you so, so much for, for sharing these stories with us today. We're, we're so grateful for it. And thank you for carrying on this legacy of your parents and, and making it so personal and so real. Thank you, Anna. Thank you very much. And thank you for the Holocaust Center, too. Thanks, Jack. And thank you to everybody for joining the program today. Whether... No, sorry about that. Whether you are watching this live or maybe later, we are so glad you are here to learn with us and to hear these incredible stories. One of the biggest compliments you can give us is to share a program with a friend, colleague, or family member. You can send them a link to future programs or invite them to join live with us on a Tuesday. Share it on your social media pages and tag the Holocaust Center. And this helps others to find our programs. Our next Lunch and Learn program is going to be fascinating and you don't wanna miss it. On October 4th, Nora Flanagan, an award-winning educator, will talk about confronting white nationalism in schools. 
She has co-authored a toolkit for schools to use, and this toolkit has been featured in the Washington Post, the New York Times, NPR, the Chicago Tribune, and elsewhere. Our Lunch and Learn programs are possible because of all of you and because we have a fantastic team at the Holocaust Center. A huge thank you today to Julia Thompson and Morgan Romero who are pulling all the strings for us behind the program. Um, and also thank you to our CEO, Dee Simon and Richard Green, Lori Warshall Cohen, Paul Regelbrug, Jessica Michaels, Amanda Davis, Devin Shirelocky, Katie Lawrence, and Branda Anderson. Thank you again for joining today's program, and we hope to see you at our next Lunch and Learn program on October 4th. This concludes our program for today.